presentation, if that's okay. Yep, I'll just start sharing my screen now. How's that? Have you got me there? Yep, yep, that looks great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll get started. Thanks, Alex, for the introduction. Um, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us for our PIG webinar. As I begin, I just, as Alex had, also like to take a moment to acknowledge the First Nations peoples and traditional custodians of the various lands on which we're meeting today to learn together. So I'm joining you from Braidwood in Yuan Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present and to emerging leaders. Just click to the next slide, there we go. So where I thought we would start um, our little journey is uh, some of the things about pigs that make them um, particularly different or unique as an animal. So of course, first of all, they have their, their, their snout. So they're adapted with that snout. It's, it's very mobile, it's very strong. Um, it's actually got a little bone in the nose there at the end of the muzzle on that sort of disc-like snout. And that has adapted them for being able to move things around to really dig and to root and dig it get to the roots of plants. Um, it's very sensitive and it has an extremely good sense of smell um, for sniffing out um, little morsels. Uh, that's why they get used for, for truffle hunting in, in Europe. So um, the other thing I wanted to show you was the layout of, of their teeth. So at the front of the, the jaw here, they've got their incisor teeth, um, which are really well designed to sort of grasp and pull at things. Um, then coming back from there, they've got these, these canine teeth, which are they're quite sharp and they, they rub against each other to keep them sharp. And in the, um, in the boars, they will actually continuously grow throughout their life. So they sort of get more and more impressive as fighting weapons. And then they have a, um, a large number of very, very big cheek teeth. So the premolars and the molars, which have um, big flat surfaces on them for, for crushing food. And you can see in this diagram also a very strong jaw. So, um, so that adaptation is, is about what sort of food that they can find. Um, here's this little bone that's actually in the snout there, um, the sort of food that they can find and dig up and, and crush and chew. Um, they have a really big stomach, so about eight litre capacity um, and a similar structure of their stomach and digestive system to us. So it's a, a simple stomach that <clears throat> secretes stomach acids to digest the food. And, and along with the snout, the teeth and the stomach, that shows us that, that they've adapted to um, a very varied diet and, um, and an omnivorous diet. So, um, so they can eat you know, vegetable materials and as well. So we'll come to more about the, their nutritional requirements and also the regulations about what you can and can't feed them a little bit further in this presentation. Um, the other thing that the, the sows have is they have a, a huge number of mammary glands. So they actually have 14. Um, so they can have a really big litter um, of piglets that they can support with those mammary glands. So the average litter size around eight or 10, um, but they could support as many as 14. Um, the, the pregnancy period, the gestation period, is really easy to remember in pigs because it's three months, three weeks, three days, um, and then you've got a litter of piglets. So um, they, can, they can certainly have um, two litters a year um, at least. So let's, let me talk to you a little bit about um, sort of how to handle and restrain pigs if you're not familiar um, with them. As with all livestock, I really encourage you to take a low stress approach. You're aiming for um, the safety of yourself and any other people that are handling the animals and of course the animal of those pigs. And they, um, they do have sort of similar herding and grouping behaviors to other livestock. They want to be together in a group. They'll follow each other um, in, in a line. You know, if you sort of got the facilities there that they've got a race or, or a ramp or something, they're gonna sort of follow, follow along behind each other. Um, they've got a really big wide angle of vision. Um, so about sort of 300 degrees with a, with a bit of a um, blind spot at the back. And, and that really fantastic vision in all directions 
allows them to sort of look for um, look for escape routes and and notice distractions. So they do tend to work better if you can have facilities that have solid barriers, um, and also we're holding a sort of solid mobile panel in front of you can be very effective because it just blocks the um, the gap between between yourself and um, your legs and sort of what's next to you. So they're not thinking, oh, there's a, a great little spot to turn around and, and zoom past you. So that can be really helpful. Generally, um, it's just about letting them learn, you know, what's expected of them, giving rewards for for doing the things that you want. They, they're clever animals and they will get used to you and get used to um, what's expected of them. They're, they're quite, curious so um and they'll they'll you know sort of be interested in new things but they if they haven't had that experience before as well they can be a bit frightened <clears throat> so take it slow be be kind and consistent give lots of rewards and and don't shout and sort of you know use sort of sudden movements just have have time on your hands and and take time to to kind of you know show them what what you want and be consistent with them and you'll have success Sometimes you will have to um, restrain them as opposed to sort of just moving them to an area that you want them in to, be, to be in. You might be needing to do some sort of husbandry procedure, you know, like a vaccination injection or, or a drench or something like that. Um, or you just want to, to check something, um, put their tag on, things like that. So, so sometimes you're going to have to restrain them. Um, they make uh, an incredible amount of noise when when they are restrained. Um, but I just want to sort of, um, I want you to be expectant of that because it doesn't necessarily mean that they're in distress or in any kind of pain. It's just their sort of vocal way of protesting that they don't want to be held still. Um, they'll be absolutely back to normal straight away when you stop. And if you prepare yourself for the noise, uh, it just helps you to complete the, the procedure that you're trying to do. Um, because if you're not expecting it, you might just say, oh, no, this is terrible. I, I can't, I can't. So um, the, the, they will scream. They definitely will. Um, and then the other thing to be aware of, of course, is your own safety. You know, especially as they get bigger, they can be very strong and heavy. Um, they might want to bite or push you if they don't like what you're doing. And, um, and the males in particular have, have substantial tus tusks. So be aware of the situation around you. Keep yourself safe. For smaller pigs, you can pick them up off the ground, just support them um, using both arms and sort of pull their, their body against your, your body. Um, but obviously, as they get bigger, it's not safe for you to, to pick them up. So there's a couple of things you can use. A snare, um, that's sort of a, um, a loop of, of wire cabling on a handle, and it goes in here behind the, the canine teeth and the, the pig will naturally pull against that. So you'll see a picture here. This pig's about to get a blood sample taken from the neck and, and a second handler is holding onto that snare and the pig is pulling back and that's immobilizing it for the, for the procedure. Uh, that's that's only if you have to sort of do these sorts of, um, you know, blood taking or things like that. If, if you don't need that level of restraint, something like a well-designed small pen or a crush, just to get them where you need them to be safely to do the procedures will do the job. So let's have a look at... Um, I've, I've tried to sort of give you a bit more of a broad approach here because I don't think it's it's necessary that we go through, you know, what is every disease that a pig could get um, and what are the symptoms of those? I, I want to look at it a bit more broadly. So let's have a look at the principles of keeping your pigs healthy. And this is um, essentially the interaction between um, what we call the host or the animal that can get a disease, the pathogen. So you know, you might call that a bug or a um, or an infection or something, but the pathogen that caused the disease and the environment that that's all operating in. So if you look at it from a point of view of keeping your pigs sort of robust and resilient to disease, um, monitoring for, for any changes in disease and keeping records and just keeping those diseases out, that's going to cover you for, for most of the things that, that could happen. Take, take that approach to it. So how do you sort of keep them robust and resistant to disease? Um, certainly one of the most important things in that is going to be their nutrition. It's going to play a really, really big part in keeping them healthy and um, keeping their immune system strong. And if there's a few, you know, sort of pathogens in the environment, it doesn't mean that every time something's there, they're actually going to succumb to it and get sick with it. So 
for all, all animals, when you're formulating diets or nutritional requirements, there's this sort of hierarchy um, that you look at in, in terms of how you formulate it. Most important, as we all know, to survival is water. Pigs need good, clean, high quality water. You know, they want to drink basically the same kind of water that we want to drink. Um, and then when you're looking at the feed components, you need the energy just to keep everything running. Um, you might you might refer to that as, as calories when you're talking about your own diets, but it's whatever the body's sort of burning to, to fuel the function of all the organs. And then um, and then there's protein as well. So protein is quite important for immune system, growth, reproduction, um, things like that. And that then you sort of go down this sort of hierarchy to other what we call macronutrients and then micronutrients. So, small, so micronutrients are things that are very important, but they're only required in very small amounts. So the, the sort of concept of you are what you eat is very true for pigs. Um, not only will the feed have an influence on, um, on health, on their growth rates, but it actually has quite an impact as well on what the end product is if you're farming for, for a meat product for pork. Um, the meat quality will be affected by what's in the diet. And, um, and the re requirements for the different stages of um, of the production system. So growing or gestating piglets or lactating um, or doing none of those things, being dry, will need different, um, different feed requirements formulated according to those sort of, um, those hierarchy that I was discussing before. So, so what you're sort of trying to attempt to do is, is get the best performance out of that pig, but also um, taking into consideration the cost of the ingredients that into the as well because in your production system feed is going to be um, a very large part of the cost you know it could be something in the order of sort of 50 to 70 percent um, and and this the the um, you know the the sooner you can sort of grow that animal to to the size or the market specification that you want um, the better and again that feed is going to have an influence on that so Pasture grass um, is not an adequate diet for pigs. When we, when we have a look at what are those energy requirements for all of those growth stages, or, or sorry, all of those life stages, um, grass is never going to meet those requirements. They just cannot eat um, enough of it. And they, their intestinal system is not designed to thrive on diets that are that high in fiber. Remember again, they, they're system is quite similar to ours and you could not eat enough grass to keep yourself alive and you know not lose weight. Um, it does have an important um, component in diet for fiber, for micronutrients, things like vitamin. If you can set up a system where they have some free ranging and they have access to pasture, that is great. Um, but, but you definitely need to, um, to, the main part of their diet is going to be something different to, to the grass. So thinking of your pasture just as a, as a bonus, not as their actual diet. And also keeping in mind that if you, you know, if you just gave them grass to eat, they would dig it right up, pull out all the roots, eat the roots, strip the pasture, and there'd be nothing left um, quite quickly. So it's not a, um, a sustainable diet for them anyway. So um, because, um, because of the need for, for the level of energy that they need, um, the diets are generally going to be based on grains and plant proteins. Um, they do better, they digest better if those grains are processed, um, you know, crushed or cracked or milled or made into a pellet, they digest that more efficiently. I've uh, certainly had some conversations with, um, with people with small farms who, who really like the idea of mixing their own diets. And um, because you get more, if you mix your own diet, you get more um, sort of precision and control over all the ingredients that go in. Um, but you really need to think about the challenges and the costs that come with that. You know, you would need equipment um, to process those grains. You need somewhere to store the raw ingredients. The raw materials can be more expensive, especially if you're buying on a small scale, um, quite a lot of labor. You want the expertise that, you know, you're going to be able to have the knowledge to, to really balance those diets correctly, to give them the, the best nutrition that you can. Um, and there's wastage involved. So, 
my advice to on small farms my advice is to purchase a commercial formulation because it's actually more likely to be cost effective and to meet their nutritional needs and also the regulatory requirements which i'm going to talk to you about now so um, you may have noticed earlier in the presentation when I was describing their anatomy and their digestive system that I said that they're omnivores so and they have a diet similar to ours so we're talking there you know well why is the diet then formulated on grains and plant proteins well that's because there are um, very strict rules around feeding of um, any material of mammal origin or any substance that's come into contact with that material. So we're talking about meat or any part of a mammal carcass at all or anything that's been stored with it or anything that's touched it. So there's a picture there of some, um, some food scraps and you certainly would be um, absolutely not allowed to feed any of that material. You know, even if you went, oh, well, there's some spinach there, I'll pick that out. You can't because it's actually had contact with that meat. And um, you may have heard the, the term used of swill feeding. So that word swill is referring to this prohibited um, mammal material. So why, you know, why is that the case? Well, that feeding of those, um, those mammal materials, those meat materials, is a pathway for some very contagious, really devastating exotic diseases, diseases that we don't currently have in Australia, um, but we feel that there is um, certainly a, a very high risk and a pretty high likelihood that at some point we're going to get it. And how are we going to get them? This will be the pathway, pigs being fed these, um, these products. Um, if we get these diseases, the impact on animal welfare and the socioeconomic consequences would just be, as I said, absolutely devastating, not just on pigs, on, on other livestock as well, depending on the disease, and of course, all the people involved in the, um, in the production chain and the ownership of those animals would be devastating. So um, that's why it is just absolutely illegal to do. Okay, so the next... Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was about, and um, we've talked about trying to, you know, have healthy and robust animals. And now we're going to talk about, well, how do we have a sort of healthy environment that they're living in as well? So um, you can certainly increase sort of health and minimize the chance of, of disease by um, by adhering to that sort of those sort of principles of a healthy environment or um, you know I guess it's a healthy lifestyle these if the pigs are living a healthy lifestyle they're less likely to get things like managing manure and hygiene essentially the 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 basic the basic principle to work with is that you don't want animals to be eating where they're pooing there should be no contact between between eating and pooing and in a in a well balanced healthy environment there's enough space that you know dung is deposited somewhere and eating happens somewhere else and it just sort of happens of its own accord um, what you can find is as as the number of animals increases so i've got a, at the bottom of that list appropriate stocking rates well how do you know you've got appropriate stocking rates well, what i find is that as the number of animals sort of starts to reach the limit of what's an appropriate stocking rate, these other things become more difficult to manage or require more infrastructure or more input or um, more labor or maybe more chemicals to maintain them. If your stocking rates are, are really nice and low and you'll probably find, um, certainly if you're just getting a couple of pigs for home consumption, this might just happen of its own accord. Um, but as you start to increase numbers, or if you have a very small space, um, you might find it's harder to, to manage the manure, the manure's building up, it's becoming less hygienic environment, um, things like air quality, um, you know, if they've, if they've denuded the pasture and everything's very dusty, um, or if they're in a housed environment, there's a lot of manure buildup, you might get a lot of ammonia, things like that. Like they, these things become less, um, uh, they, they require more management. So if you can if you can manage for a kind of healthy environment, that certainly helps. So I've listed a few things, air quality, protecting them from cold weather. Some of this is, is should be sort of quite common sense, protect them from sun and heat, fresh, clean water, I mentioned before, um, good drainage, you know, you want to tidy, you don't want them, you know, cutting themselves or injuring themselves on things and just nice low stress. 
So the next principle that I've listed there is, is learning to observe, are your pigs healthy or not? What does a healthy pig look like? What does a sick pig look like? Um, are you keeping track of whether they're healthy or unhealthy? Um, so some of the signs that you want to keep an eye out for, things that might indicate to you that there is a problem or there is a health issue. Um, we're talking about coughing, diarrhea, scratching, singling out from the herd. So an animal not being with the group um, is unusual. Not interested in eating is unusual. Lameness or animals dying. If you have any of these things happen, um, the, the next step that you want to take is to actually talk to your vet or talk to an animal health advisor if you're not sure um, and, and say, well, I've noticed this thing, you know, I want to investigate what's going on and um, what should I do? Also keep reports of what's been going on so that you can observe for changes and trends and have an idea of the sort of health status of your herd. There's, there's other ways to monitor as well. So you might want to monitor with some kind of testing or maybe with meat inspection. Um, one example that I'll give is something like internal parasites, worms. So um, worm eggs are in the pig dung, but they're too small to see. So you can actually take fresh dung samples and send them off to the laboratory for a test. And, the, and you can get a number of how many worm eggs are in there. So you can get an idea of whether, um, whether worms are a problem um, in, your, in your pigs. And also as that meat is being processed, either at an abattoir or for yourself at home, it'd be things like looking for, you know, are there actually worms in the gut? They're big enough to see in that circumstance, the, the worms themselves. Is there evidence of damage to the liver, damage to the lungs, things like that? You know, um, why might you care about worms? Well, they can cause illness and symptoms of illness. So um, coughing, pain, diarrhea, even death, if it's very severe. But at lower levels, they're still having an impact. They're actually reducing growth rates. So they're actually cutting into your um, production and your profits there. So uh, you may think, oh, I don't think I've got any worms, but um, it might be worth uh, thinking about. Should you test for it? Should you um, monitor for it? Um, and are the, the things that you're doing to manage worms, are they working? So um, always with any kind of parasite, I'm always talking about integrated management. It's not just about giving chemicals. It's also about, again, you know, not eating where there's dung. So clean troughs and managing the manure, maybe composting to kill off the worm larva, rotating pastures, et cetera. Um, but you can actually use, use these things to monitor, are those things working or do I need to also add in some chemical treatments and drenching? And as I mentioned before, when I was talking about this, we'll definitely need to keep an eye out as well for these exotic diseases. And um, because, as I said, we, we really think the risk is high and the likelihood is high as well. So, um, so what you notice any of these sorts of symptoms, so blisters, um, red and blotchy skin, or, you know, you've got lots of pigs dying or they all seem sick at once or they're all lame, nobody's eating, they seem like they've got fever or... Um, a fever you can test with a with a rectal thermometer, uh, thirty nine point five to forty two degrees. Then they've got a fever, um, and or if they're all lying down, sick. Um, there's a couple of pictures I've got for you here. So when we're saying red and blotchy skin, here's an example. There, there's another one. Red blotchy ears. Here's a um, a picture of of a, um, a blister or a vesicle on the nose. So if this happens, there's a number that you can actually call straight away. That's the emergency animal disease hotline. Um, I'll have it at the end of my presentation as well. So you can pop it in your phone and just have it there ready. Uh, if you're worried, just call it. So the other thing to, um, or the other approach to take with managing animal health is to have, have a plan of how you're going to actually keep diseases out from your herd. Um, you know, you don't want them to get sick. You don't want to bring things in that are going to cause them to get sick. And this is what um, I'm sure you've all, if you've met me before, you've heard me say the word, this is part of what we call biosecurity. So I've got a, um, a picture here, an infographic that'll just help you to think about some of the ways that that diseases can actually get in into your farm and, and make contact with your pigs. 
So we talked a bit already about swill feeding, about um, you know thinking about what is appropriate to feed and is that a source of disease? So that's um, those exotic diseases could come in that way, but you know maybe feed could be contaminated with something else, you know um, toxins or molds or something like that. So so thinking about where food's coming from, is it safe to feed? Get advice on that if you're not sure. Um, then other things that are coming onto the property. So bringing in other animals, um, any equipment or um, vehicles, you know, maybe they've gone to somebody else's farm, somebody borrowed something and, and, and it's come back. Um, your own clothes and shoes or other visitors from, from elsewhere. You know, these diseases are quite, they can be quite sticky. They can just stick on, on anything that's, that's come into contact with them and then, and then travel along. So, um, you know, if you, if you visit um, a friend or a neighbour and then you're using those same clothes and boots on, on your farm dealing with your pig, there can actually be a risk there as well. Bringing in pigs. So when you, when you buy new pigs, uh, they may be sick or they may appear well but be carrying um, diseases as well so thinking about you know do you know that where you're getting them from is a healthy source a, a herd that's that's got good that's got good health and um and evidence of that you know you want to buy from someone that you can have a talk to and say well tell me about them and and a bit of a history so you know what's going on when you bring them in having them somewhere else quarantined away from your own so that you can monitor them and see if they're showing any signs of being unwell before you, you just sort of mix them in and, and bring something in here in the southeast where where i am uh, feral pigs are a big issue we've got a big feral pig population and um, it's a bit of a battle if you've got um if you've got your own pigs is actually to 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 prevent that feral pig contact. So you really need to think about very, very good fencing and also being part of some kind of um, pest control program. So again, talk to your local land services, but, but feral pigs, they are pigs, they carry the same diseases and parasites um, and they can come in and, and spread those and potentially spread those between your pigs and another um, commercial farm as well or another um, person's home consumption pigs um, as they're moving about the landscape. And also they can, um, the boars will mate with your sows as well, which you don't want either. Um, and also, you know, pests and other vermin can bring things into so while we're on the subject of biosecurity, we'll just have a look as well at traceability. So traceability is about, um, you know, if there was to be some kind of disease, it's about having a system in place to be able to know, okay, where's it come from and where's it going so we can try and get ahead of it. And it's also about food safety. So something like a, a, um, a, a dangerous residue or something that gets picked up in, in food, we want to be able to trace that back and see um, where has it come from? How did it get into the food chain? Where else is it? What can we do to ameliorate that problem? So you have some other regulatory responsibilities there to be part of that traceability program. Um, you know, it doesn't actually matter how many pigs you have or what you intend to do with them. These, these things still do apply. So you must have a property identification code and that's issued by local land services in New South Wales. It's a unique code and number that associates with your property. The pigs have to be identified before they move off the property of birth. So if they're born on your property before they go anywhere else, um, you have to give them an identifier. So that's either an ear tag or a, a what's called a tattoo or a brand. So as they're about to move off the property, you can put it in before, but it has to be done before they leave. If they're less than 25 kilos at the time, they need to get an ear tag. If they're greater than 25 kilos at the time, they can either have an ear tag or a tattoo. This is in New South Wales. Um, then you need to register on a database online called Pig Pass. And then for each movement of pigs going off the farm, you get a national vendor declaration. So that's a document that travels with the pigs. Um, and it goes to the receiver of the pigs, it goes with them. And when that receiver gets the pigs, they have to sort of close that loop and upload it online. So if you buy pigs and you receive pigs, that's also your responsibility to then go onto that pig pass database and upload the movement and say, yep, the pigs are here, they have arrived. Okay, so this is my last slide. 
And um, I will leave you to decide for yourself whether you think that that picture is cute or horrifying, um, but it's just a, a bit of information to educate yourself that there are definitely quite a number of diseases of pigs that are zoonotic, so they can um, transmit from pigs to people. Um, so make sure that you educate yourself about those, think about what, um, learn about what you need to do to protect yourself and others um, of, for those diseases, whether that be protective equipment or um, vaccinating the pigs or vaccinating yourselves, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there are there are groups in our community that are more vulnerable to zoonotic diseases than others. So children, as an example, in that picture, um, are, particularly if they're under five years of age, they have a very, um, their immune system is only just developing. So they're very vulnerable. Um, older people, other people with immune um, suppressive conditions, things like that. So, so make sure that you're aware of the risks and you've learned what you need to do to keep yourself, selves and your families and your visitors healthy and safe. Thank you very much. So um, if you've got any questions for me, type them into the chat box and we'll have the Q&A session um, at the end after Dan's presentation. And there's that emergency animal disease watch hotline number. Pop that in your phone so you've got it just in case. Um, you know, fingers crossed you never need it, but there it is. And my email address there for you as well if you've got any additional questions to send my way. And I'll hand you back over to Alex. Yeah, I'll just ignore that. So. Yeah, so obviously here we're talking about pigs and, and at a small scale enterprise in particular. So um, I'm gonna have a quick talk about the what's, where, why, and how of raising pigs outdoors for profit. That's essentially um, what we do. So in here, so give you a quick background on us. So my wife, Gillian and I, and our daughter, Madison, um, we run a small family farm and have a, uh, an off-grid homestead. We've uh, been a bit of a life change really for us. Uh, to give you a, a very quick background, I was previously an airline pilot. Uh, we've been in farming for about uh, four or five years now. And uh, it's uh, just become a complete passion of ours and uh, consumes our life, I suppose. So I'm very, very much motivated by permaculture and regenerative agriculture in particular. Uh, I'm very interested in holistic plant grazing. There's a lot of different tools available. Uh, there's endless learning that can be had. So it's a fascinating area to be in and uh, it's very rewarding every single day. So another thing that's uh, really important to us is self and community-based resilience. So we produce as much of our own food as we possibly can. And we get, it's very rewarding to be able to provide food and essential service to our community. Um, so the main business elements to what we do on top of our homestead type things is pork and goat meat and uh, we sell that on a subscription base. So getting into the crux of it, why, why get into pigs? So I always encourage everyone to think very carefully about their context. Why, why are you doing something? Um, I think too often it, it's very easy to jump into something because we think it's a great idea or we just think it's really interesting, but we really have to think about how it sort of affects our life and, and how it's going to work for us. So a few different things I really put into three different categories. If you're keeping pigs, it might be a business like us. It might be a, a hobby farm or homestead, which is also us as well. Or it might just be for pets. And I would actually say that's us as well. We do, in a lot of ways, treat our animals. Um, in a lot of ways, not completely, but they are pets to us as well. A lot of them have names. We can certainly pat them and, and we interact with them on a pretty uh, close basis. So I'm gonna pick to talk about starting a business. Uh, I, I think if, if we cover starting a business, it really covers a lot of the other elements as well because you, you have to take care of the animals. You, you have to do all that basic needs if you're going to run a business, but I think it's important just to add a couple of things on top. So I always 
encourage people right from the start to have at least a basic business plan before you do anything else know what you're going to be doing so you, you need to think about really mundane things like profit and loss uh, what who, who are you going to sell to who's your market uh, who are your suppliers what what sort of things you need and you really need to pencil that out and make sure that this is something that you can make as viable uh, it absolutely can be but it's it's also easy to be something that you can get horribly wrong if you don't at least have a basic plan so i always like to say keep keep it simple but also have the end in mind. So you're not going to be able to start out 100% full ball right from the start. You're going to have to work your way up to it. Try not to overcomplicate things, but always have the end in mind. It, it, if you have a certain size business you want to get to, uh, if, if there's certain elements that are important to you, you might not be able to start that straight away, but just keep working towards it. And I think another really important element is don't let perfect be the enemy of good. So by that, don't wait until you have the perfect solution. Don't wait until you've got everything figured out. There's certain things that you don't even need to have in place. You can, you can sort of fumble your way through. Now I'm going to go through some things that I really think you should have in place. But just as Joel Salton likes to say, good enough is perfect. Okay. You, if, if you're waiting for perfection, you're never going to get going. So the actual keeping of pigs, the, just the basics of keeping pigs, I always try and encourage people is just think of basic survival needs. I mean, we're all, some people get uh, a bit twisted up when I say this, but we're all animals at the end of the day. So if you know how to take care of yourself, then you can take care of other animals. You've just got to sort of think it through. So the number one priority, now I'm skipping over air, I think uh, that, just a given let's hope so anyway it certainly is in the way that we farm but water water is your first and number one priority as Lou mentions you know that they like really high quality water uh, it, it is essential uh, their, their digestive system is very similar to ours and you know you're not going to be drinking stinky rancid water so um, that said it's, it's important to note that pigs are digging around the dirt. They like to climb in things. Don't, once again, don't expect perfection. So just, just go with it, make, do your best, give them the best water you can, but don't, don't get too caught up on it. We'll be okay. So consumption, how much do they have? It definitely varies depending on temperature. So is it, is it winter, is it summer? Um, that, that's going to have have a, a really big impact and it's going to be water is going to be your basically your number one management issue in summer so the size of the pigs obviously the bigger they are the more they drink the feed that you're giving them whether it's a dry feed or whether you're soaking it fermenting it um, whether you you have other things if you're particularly on a homestead maybe you have some dairy animals you maybe you make cheese you've got some whey that, that will definitely uh, affect it. And the amount of activity. So if they're in a small confined space, um, they're not doing much, then they won't need any, uh, sorry, they won't need as much, but I really want to emphasize temperature. It's really critical in summer in particular, you have to be on top of it constantly. You, your pigs could go downhill quickly and uh, you'd be surprised how much that they do consume. So, I'm just going to give you a very quick look at our watering system. Again, just trying to keep it simple. So here I'm showing a picture of it. It's, uh, it's just, it's a rapid plus waterer. Uh, it's got a little float valve in there. It's, you note that it's got a cover over where the arrow is pointing down. It's a cover that goes over the float. Now, Lou went through the anatomy of pigs and they can be incredibly destructive. Scratch that. They will be, they will be incredibly destructive. So, you need to, uh, you, you can't, if you've got access to the float, you can kiss that goodbye in about a day. So something like that is, is really uh, quite useful. Now, if you see here, we've just got a barrel. There's a 200 litre barrel. You can buy them on Gumtree for about 20 bucks. That will save your life not going out and 
filling up buckets a lot. So it just gravity feeds into here. You can probably make out there's a hose there and just gravity feeds uh, into there, into the trough. And another thing, star pickets holding down the water. So if you don't have something fixed in place, it will end up through your fence on the other side of the paddock upside down. Yeah, you'll, you'd be surprised what they can do. So here's another option. Uh, we don't use these, but uh, these are uh, pig nipple drinkers. So you can buy these as well through your rural supply store or online. Um, they're quite popular. Again, you can just uh, attach that to a barrel and uh, the pigs will just come up on, they'll bite on that and uh, it will release the water. And uh, it, it's, it's a fairly low maintenance way of doing things. One issue is if you're in a particularly cold area, they will, uh, they do have a habit of freezing and they can break. Um, but the bigger issue I see is the mud. So pigs love playing with water and uh, getting in water and they will make a muddy wallow. Now that's fine, that's, we'll, we'll get to that shortly, but um, maybe that's not particularly the place that you wanna have it. So it's just something to consider. Now we just use this, we, really simple again, we just have a, a, a siphon off the dam we drive uh, down, we fill up the IBC on the back of this, uh, what we call the farm ute, and we drive around and we fill up those barrels, just have a, um, a two inch uh, pipe coming off the side of that and just gravity feed in. So it just keeps things really simple, um, but then you can get water all over your farm. So looking at uh, the next priority after water is feed. So Lou's already mentioned about the importance of nutrition, and I would really like to second that. Um, Pigs being an omnivore, they, they can eat pretty much anything. Um, that's not to say they will, but they can. And people will sometimes use that as, as a reason to feed them just anything, anything they get their hands on. Um, now, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna re-emphasize the, the swill issue. It's definitely an issue you need to be aware of. But uh, there are ways of using waste stream feed, particularly if you're at a homestead scale. Now we, we bring in a commercial feed. We get uh, feed from um, Country Heritage Organics and uh, we use a certified sustainable feed that comes only from regenerative farms. These are just important elements for us, but it's a really high quality uh, feed that's in a pelletized form. I think that's really important as well for the way that we handle our pigs that you'll see again soon, rotating them through pastures, because they're constantly moving, we, we can actually just pour the feed on the ground and being in a pelletose form, they can pick it up. Now, something you might wanna consider is fermenting the feed. So um, I'll just, I'll, I'll go through what I've put on here. So yeah, I talked about commercial grower pellets. Um, we provide our pigs all they can eat up to five months old. They basically can't eat enough. So the, the more they eat, the better they'll grow and the better they'll do. And they won't eat themselves into oblivion, um, unlike what you might have heard about pigs. Up until that point, we find beyond five months, they will start getting way too fat and they can then get obese. But pretty much keep it simple for yourself. Just feed them as much as they'll eat up until that stage. Beyond that, uh, we ration them to two kilos per day. Now that's on the commercial grower pellet. If you're supplementing with other things, you'll have to think about your energy levels, your protein, um, all your other macro and micronutrients, and then how you're gonna balance that out. So you're, but you're looking for an equivalent of that two kilos per day. A lactating sow will need a minimum of seven kilos per day, plus additional protein if you're using a grower pellet like we do. So you can get a specific um, sow feed, but uh, we just add, we actually add uh, additional protein and we, we like to wherever we can is uh, then ferment the feed, um, particularly for the sows. Um, we, when we first started and we only had four pigs, we, uh, we would ferment all the feed. Now it's not quite practical when you're producing over hundred pigs a year. You've, you've got to be a little bit practical, but it's something that's up your sleeve. If you want to give them a bit of a boost, you can ferment that feed. And we also supplement with seaweed meal, apple cider vinegar and garlic. So they're really great ways to make sure you're getting a, a full um, spectrum on the uh, macro and micronutrients and really keeping those pigs healthy. So I appreciate you mentioned we, we farm 100% organically. So we have to take some measures, which uh, if you weren't um, restricting yourself to that, then um, maybe 
maybe you will, you might not need some of these things, but you do need something. So Lou already mentioned about raising pigs on pasture. It is a common question. People miss, sort of misunderstand they're not a ruminant animal. They don't have the four stomachs. They can't ferment um, just um, vegetable matter. So you do need, they, they, they're an omnivore and they need to be fed as such. However, they love it. They absolutely love it. When you put them into the paddock, it's one of the first things that they will go for. So um, it's don't, uh, don't dismiss it, but don't rely on it hundred percent. We do now keep in mind, I'm gonna mention again about swill. You need to be careful about that. What you see here is just vegetable scraps. So we do get a large amount of vegetable scraps every week. And it's mostly just um, leafy greens, brassica leaves and the like. So uh, it's, it, it's just to give them, it gives them something to do. Um, it, it is also a bit of diversity in their diet, which is really important. Um, but I mean, one thing you see there is pumpkin. So pumpkin seeds are really good for deworming. There's lots of things to go into that I really can't get into. Um, here in this sort of time frame, but uh, certainly lots of things to consider there. Um, and I'm not going to go into feeding, farrowing, and lactating sows. Um, it's definitely beyond the scope of this. That that could be a whole presentation itself. But um, it does require a bit more, bit more thought. You've got to really manage that. I mean, they're working super duper hard. So next thing, survival needs is shelter. So I'm going to talk about shelter in particular in winter. And again, uh, so I'm in the southeast as well, just outside of Canberra. And uh, winter for us is is really not too much of an issue. Um, you've, if you think about these three things, you have cold, wet, and wind. If you have those three things together, equals bad news. Okay. If you just manage for even just one of them so you remove the cold if it if it's warm wet and windy they're fine they're absolutely fine if they're cold and windy but they're dry again no problem and believe it or not if they're cold and wet but there's no wind they will be okay that's probably the least favorable combination of the two but they still will be okay so just think about that think about what's actually feasible for you to, to manage for and um and you should be fine. So this is something that I've uh, experimented with in the past and, and have done is just using straw bales. We've got one of our shelters there, just absolutely covered in straw bales. This is for barrowing for our, uh, when the piglets are born, they have absolutely no brown fat on them whatsoever. They're, they're, they're super, super skinny. I mean, our cells are giving, giving birth to up to 16 piglets and uh, there's, there's not a lot of room in there. So they, they come out super tiny and skinny and the cold will get to them pretty fast. So th this is a neat little plan and it worked quite well. Just the heat of the sow in that super insulated space was a super toasty warm. So that, that might be something you might consider at a small scale. And there's just another picture of how that works there. I am gonna have to keep going because this is, uh, I'm probably talking more than I should and it's gonna take all night. So I'll speed things up a little bit. For the adult pigs um, outdoors, we find in our climate, they don't need shelters in winter. They're absolutely fine. They will make themselves a nest. Um, they will pull out any vegetation, uh, particularly tusky stuff they love to pull out. They'll make themselves a nest and they'll get themselves up off the ground and they'll all cuddle in together. And um, they do just fine, which is, um, which is great. So in the warmer weather, we in in our climate it can get very hot and again they don't need shelters they um except for if they're farrowing we still want those piglets to have that bit of shelter and uh, particularly if it, if it rains um even in summer middle of summer overnight again they got no fat they can get chilled really easily so just want to keep that in mind but uh for anything that's are oh, beyond even three weeks you just, they need shade, they absolutely need shade. And uh, if you've got some trees on your property and you can move them out into there in the summer, they will do just fine. But you absolutely must always, if it's anything other than the middle of winter, they must have a place to wallow. 
So pigs can't sweat and they're really ineffective at panting. They'll try, but they don't, they're, they're not like dogs. So their mechanism for staying cool and, and maintaining body temperature is shade and wallowing in water and mud. So they really are, pigs are really happiest in mud. So, um, and here we go, I'll see if this actually work. We've got, uh, so it's not difficult. All you have to do is just uh, throw a bit of water on the ground. And uh, like in the previous picture, you saw that I um, I made a wallow and I, and I do that, and that's more for our faring sows, but it can be as simple as just spray a bit of water on the ground and they will make, make a wallow for you. So, and uh, I mean, this is just something we, we've literally just put the water on the ground there and by, by tomorrow, that will be a nice big hole. So you need to consider that also for your pasture management as well. So moving, keeping moving along, fencing. So now we're in our survival needs. This is, this is kind of like security in a way, but uh, containment. So you can see here, we use an electric net fence. We find these highly effective and um, really simple to use, um, really easy to move around. Um, you will need an energizer for that. It is, it is a psychological barrier. It is, it is a painful thing to touch. It does not cause any damage. It doesn't hurt them. Um, I've touched them many, many, many times and I will again, and I, I don't like it, but it's, uh, it, it, they, they really, they really respect this kind of fencing. I, I really, I couldn't recommend it enough. I really think this is something that you need to consider. So you can see here, we've just got it in a, in a pretty simple, um, rectangle here. And I just use star pickets at uh, each corner. If you put, if you keep it nice and tight, pigs will push things up against the fence. But if you can get a little bit of tension on it, it really does hold up in place really well, and it it reduces your workload significantly. So you can see here, I'm just highlighting there. That's the corner post of that electric net fence, and uh, drive a star picket in at um, just at an angle off from the fence, 45 degrees, and then just using a a one dollar oki strap and Notice that I've put it halfway up the post of the electric net fence. That way, if the if that post comes out of the ground, the pigs push fence. It's it's not going to go anywhere. It'll just stay there. It'll sort of float in the air, and and you really you will not have any containment issues. So that that's great. We use those net fences during our pasture rotation, which we do in winter. In summer, we move out into the shade, into the uh, the more treed areas, and we use. Um, systems of permanent electric net fence, uh, sorry, permanent uh, double strand fencing. You can get away with single strand, that's fine. But what you're looking for is to have that, that single hot wire at the height of the pigs when they're, when they're just standing naturally and they're looking forward, you want it at the height of their snout. And uh, a pig will try, uh, unlike like cattle or goats or sheep, they will go over a fence, pigs will always go under. So. Uh, better better to err on the side of too low than too high. But uh, we have two there because we grow our pigs out in these paddocks and, and it gives, that seems to give us a good coverage of really little guys to, to a little bit bigger. I won't go into how to train them today, but it's, it's um, something you can definitely find information on. Maybe we can talk about it more in, in, uh, in future, but um, once you've trained them, it's, it's super simple. So just want to quickly talk about keeping pigs healthy. Obviously, Lou talked about that a lot. So what do we do being organic? Um, we don't vaccinate and we don't worm and we, we don't do anything. <laughs> what we do do is we manage. We manage, manage, manage. So the first and most important thing is keep them moving. We're trying to mimic nature. So keep them moving as quickly as is feasible. Now, you've only got a certain land base and they're going to tear that up. So You've, you've got to think about the regeneration of the land and giving it an appropriate recovery period. So um, that, that all comes down to the, the season, how much rainfall you've had. So that's where the, the art and the science comes in and that comes with experience and observation. But uh, really, if you just think, I'm just gonna keep them moving, you'll move them away from their parasite load. They're not eating where they're defecating. They're, they, you, we, we just don't have any problems as long as you keep them moving. So 
and you can see that there. So th this this is how we move our breeding herd into the treat areas. We still use electric net fences for them. And the second option, so I really consider there's two options. It's moving, 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 or if you're staying stationary, you need to have them on vibrant decomposition, as Joel Salzen likes to call it. And we basically bring in truckloads of wood chips and we'll put those wood chips down. And so here you're looking at about uh, a minimum of 30 centimeters of uh, wood chips here. And that, that decomposing, that composting process that is going on there is helping to break the pathogen cycle. It's, it, it's balancing out the good and the bad bugs. And we, we, we don't, we wouldn't leave them all win there all winter. So we, we might leave them on this setup. Again, it depends on how you want to do it. If you want to keep adding more carbon material, you can add straw, hay, wood shavings, um, more wood chips, leaves, dry leaves, that is anything, any brown uh, carbonaceous material that has a enough surface area so it's broken up you will get that effect and you could just keep adding to the top of it. And if you keep adding, 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 well, you'll never have to move them. We find it simple. We just move them next one along and then we'll add more wood chips on and then, and then we can, we just have that cycle through. Okay. So moving on to handling. Um, I really, really, uh, I'd like to reinforce again, what Lou said, be patient, be kind and be calm. They, they can be trained. Uh, it's certainly easy once you get your big pigs. Um, once they're mature, they trust you and they're, they're the easiest ones. Um, the, the younger they get, it, it's just that they haven't been trained. They don't trust you yet. So all you need to do is have all the time in the world and everything will be fine. You will want to consider getting some sort of um, yardage facilities um, to contain them. This is particularly for things like, so we castrate our piglets, our male piglets. Um, you need something to uh, contain the sow during that uh, time. You can just move them a long way away and, uh, and that will be fine as well. But it's particularly at the end of the day when you need to load them on, onto your trailer or truck or whatever it is. And um, for loading, you definitely need somewhere to contain them. So. Um, you start off something small. This is something that we use for our goats as well and super handy because it's, it's mobile. Um, we can set it up in all sorts of different configurations, can move, move it all around the farm. So we're not trying to move the animals to it. We move the facilities to the animals. You'll need some sort of transport. Um, we just have here an eight by five trailer, uh, box trailer, fairly high side. That's not so important. I suppose that's more for moving our goats around. Um, Pigs really are not very good jumpers. I mean, they will if, they, if they're if they really forced to, but it's not their favorite thing to do. And um, we, we like to cover the sides. And so I've got solid sides and a solid front. Solid front is absolutely critical as a requirement, um, but I find if we covered sides and um, front, and then we throw something over the top. If it's strictly cold, we'll put a tarp over the top. Um, otherwise we put some shade cloth over the top, definitely in summer. I put down, um, I made a false floor out of wood um, for it. And then I put um, some mesh, uh, like uh, some concrete reinforcing mesh. It, it's a common thing to use in trails for transporting animals so they can get some grip. And then I throw a bale of uh, hay and straw down. So ours are fairly spoilt, I suppose, um, compared to what I see. And um, I, I load them up um, the night before, literally right at the end of the day, as late as I can make it. And then I get up at uh, 2, 2.30 in the morning and take them off to the abattoir that way. That's, the, that's how I can find the least amount of stress. So they basically just go to sleep. They just sleep in the trailer. It's like a big shelter for them. Um, so moving now back into more of the business things um, as I'm sort of moving towards the end here. Uh, you need to have some things in place. The common mistake I see people make is they get pigs. And they don't realize that by five to six months old, so by 20 weeks old, you might buy, if you were to buy a wiener from us, we, we don't wean them until eight weeks old. And uh, by 20 weeks, so 12 weeks later, you're going to have an 80 kilo pig. 
Now, if you go much bigger than that, you can go six, seven, eight months, potentially. If you get anything above about 120 kilos of the abattoir, I will not process them on their pig line and they will put them on the cattle line and you will not get the result you want. They'll end up skinned and halved and, and you don't want that. Well, I don't want that. So um, the, you need to have access to an abattoir. This is a real issue. So um, we use the Cowra abattoir. It's actually the closest one to us that will we'll accept pigs um, in our area for domestic small scale. And um, it's not as simple as where you just turn up or even you, 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 like you have to get an operator number. You, you obviously we've talked about uh, you need a pick. You need to get your pig pass, you need to get your tattoo, you need to have all these things lined up and you shouldn't expect that you can just click your fingers and have these done. So you really, you, you wanna to get to this uh, pretty soon. So the next thing is how are you gonna butcher them? Um, you might find it difficult to butcher. We have a really, really good relationship with the Red Hill Butcher. Um, Corey and Tony, they're amazing. They, they do amazing work for us and uh, and we've really got that down pat now, but you've got to think about how, you, how you're going to cut them up. Um, what, what are you trying to make? How big, how big are your packages? How are you packaging them? All that sort of thing. And then you got to, you've got to think about your food handling after that. So um, I don't have a photo of it in here, but we've got a, we've got a rather large 10 by six um, mobile freezer room. And uh, so you need to think about, or, appropriate regulations around that how are you going to store it i mean we have many 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 chest freezers as well and um it's scales labels you got to it, it can get fairly in depth but don't let it freak you out you will figure it out but just uh, work your way through it and then at the end of the day you got to figure out how you're going to sell it so i would recommend that comes down to your business plan that we talked about at the start you need to have a plan. Now we have a subscriber base. Uh, we have, we currently have about 65 subscribers and they'll get a monthly or a bi-monthly bundle of pork, goat or either. And, um, and it's a really great model for us. It keeps us in contact with our customers. Um, they can come and visit us anytime. Um, we can accept feedback from them and it enables us to sell the whole pig. Um, that can be a real issue if you're selling to restaurants uh, in particular, that uh, they might just want pork bellies one month and they might just want shoulder the next and you've, you've got a whole pig you've got to sell. So you really need to think about that. I'll leave it at that. Uh, it could go on and on and on and on, um, but I've probably already used way too much time already. So let's leave it for questions and um, happy to, uh, engage with anyone in the future um so lou we'll start off with you mm. um do pigs have any crossover worm issues or diseases with horses sheep sheep goats alpacas or chickens okay so um yes definitely pigs are susceptible to diseases that other animals can carry um i'd probably say less so with worms, their worms are probably a bit more species specific, um, but some of the parasites, the mites, they could share. They don't share lice. They've got their own lice. Um, but really that question uh, makes me think about some of the, the, the real risks with regards to our exotic diseases. Um, foot and mouth disease, for example, would spread between um, a number of different species, anything with a, with a cloven hoof, so pigs, sheep, goats, um, cattle. And when we look at that swill feeding legislation, remember that it says um, you can't feed a pig any mammalian product. So if you, um, if you think about what that means, that means if they're co-grazing with other animals, and they have access to that animal's dung, then you're actually um, breaking that swill feeding legislation. So, so the recommendation is not to co-graze them directly with other species. You can use them in a pasture rotation uh, where they, they will end up on ground that other species have been on, but not to actually have them in the same paddock together. It's a complicated little bit of legislation. It, it's, a, it's a difficult one for small and diverse um, um, mixed farming. So definitely you know, with regards to that, have a bit more of a direct chat with your district vet about what you can and can't do there. 
Okay. Thanks, Lou. So, and this one is for Dan. Um, so, and the questions are from one of our um, members, Suze. Firstly, we loved eating the pork that you've produced. Um, what is the biggest management issue that you find with pigs? And do you have any tips for those wanting to raise a few pigs for their freezer? Yeah, okay. So I think um, the biggest management issue is, as I think I highlight, is moving them. You like keep that's that's your main workload. Um, I did talk about in summer keeping them cool and shaded. That's that's uh, critical. That can be a lot of work, but um, if you can if you can keep them moving or keep them on a on um, on a carbonaceous diaper, then um, they will they will perform really well for you. So I think that's that's the biggest sort of issue. Um, advice for someone raising themselves: don't get one. They're very social animals. They won't do well on their own. Um, mm -hmm. I, I always, I, I, um, no, I won't. I was going to derail myself down the pet avenue, but I'll, all I'll say is quickly: I don't. I personally don't think they make great pets. Um, that that's per, people's place, time, and circumstance. But I think you need minimum of two, and um, three is better because even two can be an issue. But yeah, and then have those sorts of things in place. Think about the end goal. How are you putting them in the freezer? Uh, if you're not selling them, you can do it yourself. I do my own just for ourselves. Um, you might find someone local to you that is able to do that for you, but really think about how you're going to do that because that can be pretty overwhelming to get those pigs and suddenly now you're figuring out, well, I've now got to get a pig pass and my tattoo and get into an avatar and find a butcher and yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay, that, that sounds good. Thanks, Dan. So I think that you and Lou would be able to see the questions. Um, and one of them was just a comment about feed supply. Um, and I'll probably direct this to you, Dan. I don't know if you can see it, but um, unfortunately, many feed companies will not supply small quantities of specific diets. Um, and they can only get grower diets in bags. What, what's your experience with getting bulk feed and how do you manage that? Yeah, okay. So we we get it by the one-ton bag, so bulk a bag. And um, we get in the order of, uh, it varies depending on the month, but between two and four of those in a delivery. We work with uh, our local rural supply store. So in here, it's um, Bungador Rural. That, um, and they bring it out that they manage that um, and so yeah we look we started with bags and I was mixing my own feed and supplementing that and doing all that yeah. and that's when you got four pigs that's fine um, I did talk about like us using the grower uh, pellets and you're talking about you can only get them in bags I assume that's a, like a 20 kilo bag uh, and yeah that's cost prohibitive you you can't manage that I, I think even if you've got uh, if you do the maths on keeping a pig for three or four months and you you have three or four of them, you'll go through a ton of feed, mm. like literally one ton of feed. So if you can handle it, I, I would get your bulker bag and you're going to get, uh, you're going to get uh, pay about half the price. So if you can manage that, do that. As far as getting um, specific feeds mixed up, I do find, um, now this, this might, you might find yourself priced out of the market here, but if you're going organic, and you're going to Country Heritage. Um, Ron there, who's the operations manager, is amazing. We'll spend all day on the phone with you. And they will do up um, individual mixes of as small as one ton. All right. Um, so so you, can, you can absolutely do that. You are going to pay roughly twice what you'll pay from uh, if you're going from an, a conventional feed supply, um, such as Riverina or Amboss or whatever or, uh, in this area. Um, but they, they're not going to tailor to your small needs in my experience. So, yeah, something you might yeah. want to consider. Okay. So um, there's a question about how many pigs per square metre. Um, is that I'm only bit... really relevant, like, is, is that relevant for outdoor running? Yeah, I'm around? happy to make a comment on that. 
Alex, I think yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a very common question that I get, um, you know, I've got this amount of land, how many pigs can I have? I think I feel like it's not the right question to ask. I think there's, it's, um, it's a very blunt instrument to say, I've got this much space, how many animals? There's a lot more to it in terms of what um, stocking density your, your area of land can support. Um, and, you know, Dan's talked about his, his way of moving the pigs around and working out um, a, a stocking density that works for the area that he has. And that sort of goes back to what I was saying about that healthful environment. It's trying to find that balance of where can you where can you keep things at a, a reasonable level of, of um, management and inputs and labor uh, and and things sort of stay stay healthy and also protect the environment from damage. So it's a it's a much more complicated question than how many pigs for you know how many acres. But one of the resources you can use is the agriculture advisors in local land services um, can actually talk to you about how to work out, you know, what resources you have, what type of land, um, uh, yeah, what type of environment it is and what it can handle and, and, and tease out some of those um, more specific questions about how many pigs for the amount of area that you have. Okay, okay. So um, Lou, we, we sort of touched on this a little bit, but there, the question there is, are pigs more prone to worms than other stock? And you've talked about that in just relation to manure management and that kind of thing. Um, what's your feeling I don't, about that? I mean, I don't know about more, um, like more prone to worms than, than other livestock, um, but but within any group of livestock, there are um, classes of animals that are more sensitive to it, or, or if they have worms, it affects them more severely. So, so young pigs, mm -hmm. um, you know, if young pigs have a worm burden, it's more likely to have an impact on them. And then um, and in late pregnancy, um, all animals in late pregnancy, their immunity actually drops a bit. So if they've got a worm burden there, um, that's when it's more likely that they'll be um, affected by the worm burden. Um, but yeah, any any animal that's um, that's having access to, you know, where they're eating or grazing is also where their dung is. There is that, that potential for that life cycle to occur. Yeah. Mm. So that sort of flows on to the next question. And Dan, jump in here too, if you've got any comments, please. But um, so what kind of pasture rotation is recommended and can they stay in a pen indefinitely to, if other conditions are met? So you talked about yeah. that a little bit. I'll make a couple of comments and then I'd really, um, I think Dan probably can give a lot of um, uh, value to that conversation. In terms of pasture rotation, usually the way I look at it as a vet is about the life cycle of the worm. How long can that worm survive mm. on pasture? And yeah. pig worms can actually survive quite a long time, several years, in fact. Um, but, you know, being exposed to um, hotter temperatures and, and, and or, or drier environments does help to kind of um, to, um, to clean up the, the pasture or other, other types of um, management of the pasture can help. Um, the, the question about um, can they stay in a pen indefinitely? Um, yes, I think they can. And um, so long as you're managing for, for health, um, for environmental stimulation, they need something to do and to occupy their minds. Um, but in terms of the health side of things, Dan, if you can talk more about, I think you used the phrase vibrant decomposition. Um, the terminology that I've previously used is a deep litter system. Um, and that is really, really good for breaking down worm eggs and pathogens and actually keeping that pen environment super healthy. So um, I'll hand over to you, Dan, to chat about that. Yeah, for sure. So um, I think people think of a pen and quite often they think of like a concrete floor and, and hosing it out and and doing that, no, I, I really, I mean, my, my personal opinion, but I think that's a recipe for design. Now I know that's used in large commercial and it can be done. And you, you're going to have to think about hygiene really, really carefully. But if you want to employ nature and you want to use that deep litter, um, that mulch, then I, I would either, I like the idea of having two where you can move from one to the other and you can then add some mulch in, it gives you a little bit of rest period, but it's not essential. As I say, as long as you start with a minimum of 30 centimeters of dry carbon to start with, 
it doesn't matter that it then gets rain on it. It, it has that absorbive uh, ability. So start with 30 centimeters and then just keep adding it whenever they, wherever they manure. They, if they're in a small spot, pigs, they will pick a, they'll pick a toilet area. Um, so if you can find them to a small area, they will pick a small area. When they're in a big area, they kind of go, oh, this is all right. They, they relate and they, they start just going everywhere. So it actually in some ways can be easier to manage. If they're in a small area, you just keep adding more mulch to the top of it. Um, and that, if you're getting a good compost and you can, you can get a thermometer and you can measure it. And if you're getting up to at least that 55 degrees, you're really starting to break down those pathogens. So uh, that, that's your minimum 55, um, but that, that might be something to consider. You're effectively composting at that point. Okay. So um, Lou, there's a question there about, um, can you talk about vaccination for eerie and leptospirosis, please? Uh, yeah, so um, erysipelas, leptospirosis and parvovirus is a combination vaccine that's quite commonly used in um, a lot of commercial pig enterprises. Um, so as far as vaccination goes, um, those are probably, you don't have to vaccinate, um, but that would probably be the standard basic vaccination protocol um, that I would generally, generally recommend, um, mainly from the perspective, or two things really. Um, from one side of it is that those diseases cause um, problems with fertility or reproductive loss. So um, in, some, in some herds, your, your um, production will be impacted by those diseases because you won't be producing the number of piglets that you would, um, that you would with it in the absence of those diseases. So those vaccines are available to that for that. And also the fact that leptospirosis and erysipelas are both zoonotic diseases. So by vaccinating the pigs, um, you, you're adding a layer of protection for yourself and people that are interacting with those pigs. So as far as vaccines for pigs goes, those are what I would say would be your, your basics. We generally would vaccinate the retained sows that are breeders because they're those reproductive diseases. Um, we wouldn't routinely vaccinate um, the the piglets, unless you're having disease issues that are investigated by a vet, there's a range of other vaccines that do get used, um, but those are specific to managing problems that have occurred. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Great, great. So I think we've uh, we've answered the space question, um, and there's a question there about specifics about getting sows in pig and so on. So I just did like to invite Tracy to contact either yourself or one of the other district vets directly to discuss that. Yeah, um, that'd be great. Um, there's a question there, Dan, about how do you organise a tattoo? Is that related to the PIC um, procedure? Yeah, it's, it is. It's, um, you get it through the local land service. So you, as part of your... Um, your pig pass, and then you will get the paperwork sent out, which will have your tattoo number. And then to get the physical tattoo, you go to, like I went to Bunganore Rural, you go to your local um, rural supply store and they can order it in for you. No doubt you can do it online as well. Um, and yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty simple. It's just like a paddle with a whole heap of little tiny needles on it. You dip it into some ink that you buy as well. Um, either on a pad or in a bowl or something like that. And it's, called, it's what's called a slap tattoo. So you, you just slap it onto one of their shoulders. Onto the, and um, and it, the little tiny needles just penetrate. It, they hardly even react at all. So it's, um, yeah. And I just do that once I've loaded them on the trailer, to take them abattoir. So they're contained in there. And then I just climb over the top of the trailer and just do them all then. Okay, okay. Alex, I noticed in the chat that um, Stephen made a comment tattoos that all pigs over 20 kilos have tattoos, not ear tags. Um, it's definitely the preference to tattoo a pig over 25 kilos, but if you're not able to, for some reason, they are allowed to have an ear tag instead. But we, we would recommend um, that, a, that a pig has a pig over 25 kilos is tattooed. Yeah, yeah. And there's a comment there too from Stephen about um, you can't sell from the farm gate unless you've been slaughtered, not you, but the pig has been slaughtered in an accredited abattoir. Um, That's correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, 
So we um, say kill, killed on farm stays on farm is the sort of little phrase to um, yeah. to remind yourself that you can consume meat that you've slaughtered on farm yourself, but you cannot sell it off the farm. Okay. Okay. That's a good little um, little ditty. Hmm. Um, okay. So let's go down to um, Dan. I think did we cover the grower pellets? Um, I think from memory you were saying that it's ad lib up until um, they're five months old and you don't yep. at this stage, um, you're not supplementing with something different. Is that correct? Yeah, so they, um, yeah, so they get ad lib to the pellets. Um, so meaning is they can eat as much as they want up until five months and then, um, and then we take them down to the two kilos per day. Uh, we do add the seaweed meal um apple cider vinegar and some garlic as a as a constant and we do like to throw in charcoal from time to time for them to nibble on if they want it's it's like an old um pre-1950s uh miracle cure for pigs i suppose but we do find it highly effective um if we do find any pigs that are just seem a little bit lethargic or not quite themselves um they will they'll just they'll munch down on the charcoal and it um it picks them up almost instantly. So those combinations of, of really those four things, um, seaweed, apple cider vinegar, garlic and charcoal uh, are really the supplements, okay. fresh pasture and, um, and, the, and the vegetable scraps, I suppose. It's just, that, that's, that's more for them to have something to do, keep them occupied. But um, I did notice someone asking about what pellets were. So we, we use, I, think I did mention it, we use country heritage organics. We use um, certified sustainable. Um, so it's a uh, no pesticide, no um, herbicide, obviously, uh, non-GMO, and it is. Um, we use a soy-free as well. So we okay. we think that that's personally important. So yeah, it's it's you can you basically can't buy any more expensive feed in this country. So it's not uh, it's not for the faint-hearted. Um, but yeah, we okay. we uh, we value it. Great. Okay. Um, Lou, do you got any comments about a pig that's been castrated and how long their tusks will grow or if they'll grow? Um, I think their tusks will continue to grow mm -hmm. um, most likely. And you can, there is actually um, a procedure that you can do to just to get the tips of those tusks cut down just so that they're a little bit um, less dangerous. Um, some people will be able to do that with a very well behaved um, pig without um, a sedation or restraint. But in most cases, you're actually going to get your vet in to give you a hand with that. They use an embryotomy wire and just get the sharp tips off the, the tusks. I think it's a good question. I think they would continue to grow. Um, I wonder if Dan has a comment on that. Uh, I don't know, you castrate, but probably by the time, um, but the, they're all going in the freezer. So you haven't got bores with them um, with tusks. Yeah, yeah. The only the only older males are all are whole whole males. So no, I I don't know. It's an interesting question. I hadn't thought yeah. about. Yeah. Um. So there's a comment there about um finding a, accredited abattoirs for pigs. Mm. I I think that the abattoir abattoir question is a perennial problem. Mm. Um. I, I know I hosted a meeting of where the small farms network business group only. A, just about less than a month ago. And it, it just seems to be a perennial problem. Um, I, I'm not sure that we can solve it. Dan, do you want to make a comment or? Yeah. It, it, yeah, it, it's it's a real issue and it's not getting easier. It's only getting harder. And um, if they, yeah, it, it, it we're, we're actually, well, we're, we were due to have a meeting on Thursday out here on the farm between all the local um, meat producers. And that was going to be one of the, the key things we were really going to discuss. It's obviously now not going ahead, but um, yeah, yeah it, look, I, I think it, it needs some serious consideration, but I think also the question, how, how do you find it? Um, it? It's a valid question because it's not something you can just go and do a search online that easily because they're actually fairly guarded in themselves, probably for, uh, you can imagine why, um, but I would I would go and talk to small butchers, small local butchers, because they all get it from an abattoir. Uh, I would go to farmers markets and I would just, I would ask any meat producers there who they use. Um, people in this sort of scale are always pretty 
keen and happy to share anyway. So that, that's how I did. I just asked the other people who was the best and, um, and yeah, went from there. Okay. Ken, um, how old is too old to butcher a pig? Like what happens to a boar or whatever once they've gotten to the end of their reproductive life? Um, they're never too old. As long as they're still alive, they're fine. Um, they're absolutely fine. So we sometimes choose to do, do the boars just for ourselves on, on farm. Um, sometimes they'll go through the abattoir as well. It's absolutely fine. Just think about how you're butchering it. So it, it's an older animal. So it's like mutton and sheep or something like that. So uh, we, what we do is we do a lot of mincing and we do a lot of cures for everything. So we'll turn it all into ham, bacon, smoked sausages. Um, yeah, all, all, all that stuff. It's still amazing. People do worry about boars, particularly they talk about boar taint and it is, it is a real thing. Yeah. Um, I think, um, yeah, that's probably, that's a whole different question, but yeah, no, okay. go for it. Go for it. Don't, uh, don't waste. Don't waste the meat. Use it. It's awesome. And um, yeah, yeah. Just a question there from Kara, Kiara about um, uh, we have pigs specifically to deal with nut grass and weeds. They're letting them eat the eat through to bare earth before rotating. Is that an issue? Like, is that too far? How is it for no. erosion and that yeah. kind of thing? Yeah, no, so we, we're managing for serrated tussock. We inherited quite a mess. So we, we use the pigs and we, we push them hard in that, in that scenario in winter out in that pasture and we, we get them to dig out every little bit. And yes, you are denuding the landscape, but you're doing it. What you want to do then is you want to put them in a small enough area that they're able to do that in a short enough time frame so they're not sitting in the one place for too long. So tighten up the space and get them to do that. And then as soon as you move them out, what we're doing is we're throwing down a perennial pasture seed mix, which is specific to our local area. And whenever I come back from the abattoir, I bring back junky hay and straw from, because they've got all the irrigation systems out there, you can get it really cheap. So I just load up the trailer and the ute and bring all that back. And say, for example, on about 150 square meters, I'm covering it with about six to eight bales. So it's, it's, not, it's not thick, but it's just just a covering um, right. and that it, it'll just fire away just just putting that little bit of cover on there to stop so you're not getting that percussive effect of the rain hitting directly on the soil yeah um, you'll stop that hard cap occurring and yeah but if you tr if you're trying to eliminate something just let them let them go go to town just tear it up completely um, but as I say I re-emphasize tighten up the area so you're not sitting them there for months and months and months Ideally, I like to not leave it, them anywhere longer than two weeks if I can. And so if, if I wanted to nude it, I've, I've got to make it tight. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, Dan, there's a question there about breeding schedules. Um, what's your feeling about that? Is, is that breeding question, like, require a long answer or can you make no, some? No, no, I can do that quick. So, uh, plan. So the question is, um, what's the breeding schedule? Is it free range or planned? So I mean, I think by that they mean, is it is it just laissez flare? Fair? Do they just? No, we definitely plan it. Um, we wean the piglets off the sow at eight weeks. When you do that, if you don't wean them, then they they naturally start to wean at about ten weeks anyway. So industry can go a lot sooner than that. Common commonly three weeks, and it can even be be younger than that but at eight weeks it's a really good balance um, the sow's kind of over it by then we move them out and within three days two to three days she'll come into heat almost straight away I don't like to breed her straight away I like to give her more of a rest so I skip that heat cycle and then I, I put her back with once I've seen that heat cycle which is very obvious then I'll put her back with a ball if, if I'm breeding them straight back and then I'll, I'll breed her then and that way I'm getting I'm, I'm getting almost two litres a year. So you can, you can push them a lot harder than that. But no, I definitely plan it because I've, I've got to plan when I need my supply. And yeah. occasionally I will, I will let a, a sow skip another heat cycle or even two, depending on mm. if she needs more of a rest. So yeah, yeah. definitely plan okay. it. It's, it's important. So we've, we've sort of talked about the rotationally grazing and the number of pigs um, 
in a pen proof. So I think we might leave that because we have touched on that. I think if you're going to do calculations and that, you're going to have to look at um, like the space and, and that. But I think from what you're saying, it's sort of keep it pretty tight um, and um, for the space requirements for managing weeds and that kind of thing for grazing. Yep. Yeah, go yeah. and have a look. If you're looking at two or three pigs for your backyard and you want an pen, go and look at some videos by Justin Rhodes and he laid, he shows an example. Um, so he's on YouTube. He has a big YouTube channel. So Justin Rhodes. Um, R Is it R-O-A-D-S? Uh, it's R-H-O-D-E-S. Oh, yeah. And he shows what he calls a pig port. And so he puts them in like a mobile carport and he puts them on deep litter. And he has yeah. two pigs in there and he, he starts talking about space there. So I think at that oh. scale, I, I would recommend it. And, and he he uh, gets his information directly from Joel Selton. So he, uh, Okay, that's great information. Yeah. Thank you. So Luke's question about the Dewa River for distance away from, um, from the river. I think we might leave that because I'm going to discuss that just very briefly at the end about council requirements. Um, so we'll come back to that, Luke. Um, so do you feel that for just for home use for freezer filling operations, Dan, that it's more efficient to have a sow and boar to breed piglets or just to buy a few weaners each year? If I highlight the word efficient, it's more efficient to buy wieners from yeah. someone else and just do that. But you've got to, I mean, what's your context? Where, where are you? Do you have breeders around you? Do you like the way that they raise their piglets? Um, is it, can you get them when you need them? Um, all those sorts of things. So I think if you can find someone local that's doing a good job and, and, and don't expect to just turn up on their doorstep and get them any time that it suits you, plan ahead and think about what time of year you're going to do it but if you want to go down the resiliency and the self-sufficiency then you'll need your own breeding stock um, and there'll be a there'll be a cost and a workload associated with that the beautiful thing about just buying them in is that you can buy them at eight weeks you can raise them up to 12 weeks it can be three months in the year you could do three or four even and um, and you could fill a chest freezer with that and then it's to turn it off for the rest of the year and just just focus on other things if that's what you want to do so yeah, it all comes down to your context. Yeah, okay. Um, there's a question there for you, Dan, about what breed of pigs you are running and whether you cross yep. them or not. Okay, so our boars are all Duroc. They're purebred Duroc. In Australia, there's only eight breeds of pigs you can get. We're very much limited on what we can have. So um, for us, outdoors, selling into a, a retail meats type market, Duroc works really, really well. We do cross them um, because of the limited genetics in Australia, the Duroc it does not have very good maternal lines. So they don't make particularly good mothers. There are of course exceptions, and um, but we we do have a little bit of Tamworth, a little bit of Saddleback just within our within our sales. But um, you don't need to cross them. We, we are moving more and more towards um, closing our herd towards more of a, a Duroc line and, right. and selecting for maternal instincts. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think Alex, there's a, there's a lot to go into in the, the genetic side as well. Yeah. Um, you know, that could be a whole other conversation, but genetics plays a really big part in, um, in the system. You know, if you think about sort of 200 years ago, pigs would have grown to maybe about 40 kilos over a period of maybe two to three years. And now we have, have developed breeds that can grow to 100 kilos in five months. So there's um, there's been a lot of genetic selection. Um, and I think that is, you know, if you really, it, and genetic sort of um, choice would be really specific to the context of what you're trying to, what you're trying to achieve. And, um, and you know, I'm sure Dan, you would agree with that, that choosing the right genetics for the outcome that you're looking for is quite important. Yeah, okay. It's, it's, so It's great, yeah, it's everything. Yeah, thanks, Dan. There's just a question there for Lou about can you get vaccines for one or two pigs? Um, you the the 
smallest sort of size of vaccine um, vial that you're going to be able to buy would have probably up to about 40 doses in it. Um, mm -hmm. So you can't buy single doses, but, um, you know, have a look at the cost. It may well be that, um, that it's not cost prohibitive for you to buy the 40 doses, use one or two and discard the rest. Or um, you could talk to your private vets and see whether they have um, shared vials of vaccine, so open vials that they would, um, you could take your pig in and get vaccinated potentially, just depending on what your situation is. But just have a look at the price. No, you can't get one or two, but it may be affordable to just buy the 40 dose vial and use the one or two doses. Yeah. So um, they don't, um, sorry, just to say they don't store um, for long periods of time. So you would have to discard the remainder. You can't sort of keep that vial and, and use it indefinitely. Right. Yeah. Okay. So do pigs trotters need trimming? Um, I'd be interested to see if Dan ever has to do it. It's um, it's really specific to your, to the um, environment that they're in and, and possibly a genetics thing there again. Um, not typically in the commercial systems that are on hard floors. It tends to wear their hooves down, but sometimes some of the older sows um, on softer ground in free range, yes, you might need to um, to just monitor what their feet are doing and, and, and do a trim. Dan, do you find that you need to do much foot maintenance? Yeah, I think I think it comes again down to genetics, particular also diet is I think probably important. But mm. um, we we never we never have to do it. A couple of our sows will get start to get elongated um, totters, and then I'll, I'll think I'm yeah I'm going to have to trim that, and then it'll break off, like right. not not in a pain not in a painful way, but just like you know like the end of your fingernail just like. It seems to self-manage, so no, I've never had to do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd probably also add in there as well with regards to their foot health and foot maintenance is what comes in with being able to grow that rapidly and be a very large size animal. Um, they do have relatively small feet, I suppose, for their body size. Mm. So I do see problems with pigs that are um, overly fat and they can get real sort of arthritic joints and painful feet and joints because they're actually carrying far too much weight through those joints and, um, and can cause real sort of cartilage pressure problems. So maintaining a healthy weight is important as well for their feet. Okay. I th that, that's probably almost the number one failing I see people do when they're having their own two or three pigs. And yeah. I've, I've sort of consulted for a number of people with that and they just get way too fat feeding them two kilos a day you think you're being cruel it's all they need they will do just absolutely fine don't don't let them get too fat they i saw a question about fertility that it certainly can affect fertility there's lots of there's lots of problems with it um you're not being cruel keep <laughs> be, be uh yeah keep them lean okay not, not skinny not skinny just lean right so um Dan, can you tell us how old you castrate your piglets? Yeah, um, for the, the younger, the better, in a, in a sense, um, because they, look, they all bounce back pretty well, but don't, don't leave it too late, just from an actually physically handling them point of view, you gotta think about how you're gonna do it, actually being able to hold them. Um, also, if you get, if you let them to get eh, beyond, I'm gonna say, Again, this probably varies from pig to pig, but about six weeks onwards, the testy actually starts to attach um, internally via a, um, like the fascia starts to form it. And the, the testy, when they're younger, is sort of kind of like floating around in, yeah. uh, in, a, cav in a cavity there. And yeah. so, when, so uh, when you remove the testy, it's, it's a lot less trauma for them. It's much easier to do. So I like to aim for, some people do it, from two days old, I, I like to leave it till a week. I, I aim for between one to two weeks old. Right. That's well for us. There's okay. a there's a follow up question there, Alex. Um, mm. Just asking about method of castration. Someone's asked rubber band castration. Um, Dan, I assume you're doing um, incision castration. Rubber band castration mm. is definitely not recommended. No, I I I don't even know how you'd do that on a pig. To be honest, they're they're essentially internal. I I I ring our goats. Um, but I don't, yeah, it, it's incision and removal. Yeah. And that, that probably sounds, it, it, it's not that bad. 
it's really not that bad. It'd be um, significantly less painful for the piglet than a rubber band would. A rubber band wouldn't be appropriate for a piglet. Okay. Excellent. No, yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, so what do Dan, what do you do with your pig, with your boars when they're not being used for mating? So once they've, once they've bred the sow, then uh, as Lou said, it's three months, three weeks, three days. So um, you've got 115 days and I just leave them with the sows that they've, that they've bred. They run with those and then inevitably then I'll, I'll have the next lot that need to go in. So I run our sows basically in groups of, uh, in, in three groups. And so the boar just moves around between them. Um, and then the boars that aren't, aren't working, they, they're just staying together. So I bring, I've got younger boars coming up through i like to i don't like to just have one in case something happens so currently i actually have a lot more than i need i have four so i have my main main boar i've got his protege coming up and he's got just two young little guys and i kind of keep them just in case because i like to be they're 50 percent of your herd the genetics so i really like to be able to pick the best that i can and i can really only figure that out if i let a couple of them grow out to see that but yeah don't don't leave them on their own they don't need to they won't I don't know. I mean, again, maybe it's genetics. Maybe it's the way they're kept, but they're not aggressive. They don't fight. Or is it? Don't it? They're, they're super placid. They're they're fine. Um, okay. Their tu yeah, their tusks can be an issue. Yeah. Um, they can they can get long and super sharp, and I don't think they mean to, but they can start causing some problems then. But yeah. Yeah. So when you um se so when so just before farrowing, you're separating out the um sows. And then you just keep them separated, like you keep the sow on its own while you're skipping that cycle. Is that correct? Yeah. So the the sows go into, you can either separate the sows individually and individual shelters, um, depending on your sows. Um, you just have to know their personalities. You can just put them all in together and that's fine too, if they're good like that. Uh, and that's my preference if we can, but some are better than others. Uh, yeah. So just before, and it's like clockwork. If you if you monitor when they were bred, they are super super consistent. It's 115 days to the day. Like it's amazing. Um, so uh, yeah. So you really know if you if you write it down, put it in a spreadsheet, you'll know exactly what's going to happen and when. Put them in there, and then all to wean them. The best way: don't remove the piglets from the mother. Remove the mother. So for us, because we're always moving them, the mothers are used to me. We just open the fence. The piglets have never moved over the fence, so they'll just stay where they are. The mum will just walk out and follow you with a bucket off to the new paddock, close oh, the fence back brilliant. up. Job done. It's it, there's no stress. It's really really simple. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's wonderful. Yeah. Now, look, I think that we've captured all of the questions there, and I'm mindful that we've that we're now um, at um, ten to ten to nine. Um, we're not going to turn into pumpkins or anything, but it is a long time for, for you to have been speaking for and for us to be online. So I'm, I'm just wondering, is it okay if I just share my screen for just a couple of minutes and then I'm going to come back to both of you to wrap it up? Is that okay? Yeah, that sounds yep, great, you know, Alex. I, 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 all I know is one other, one, there was just one other question and I yeah, think yeah, we've sure. covered it all, is yeah. the, uh, how much meat you get first bone. So you can expect okay. your carcass the, the basic the basic maths is you'll get 75 percent from live weight to hanging weight for your carcass and so unlike a ruminant animal it's much much it, it is much better because they don't have all all of that gut they don't have the four stomachs going on so 75 yeah. percent and then if you're thinking about retail cuts what you would expect to see in a supermarket or a butcher it's a, it's 75 percent of that again so you take your you take your carcass weight and multiply that by 75 percent and that'll get your retail so for example a five to six month old pig that we take is 80 kilo live weight we'll get about a 65 kilo carcass and we'll get about 50 kilos of retail cuts oh okay okay excellent thank you cool okay so um i'm just going to share my tip and about truffle farming um, we've recorded um, our backyard chicken keeping webinars. 
So I'm um, just letting you know and inviting you um, to, to join us there on the channel. And our upcoming, just to let you know about our upcoming events, we've got a members conversation there on the, second, on the 7th of September at 7 p.m. The member conversations are for financial members of the network and are run by the Small, by the small Farms Network Committee. Our next business group discussion is about marketing ideas for small farms. Member conversations are about supporting and connecting like-minded like people in casual discussions about a particular topic. And we also have a sheep discussion group. If you're interested in joining the network, membership costs $22 per person per year, and membership benefits include early event notification, access to members only events, advertising in the newsletter, and your financial commitment helps us to keep running free events like this one. So we have um, our Small Farms Network website where you can book for events, become a member, find workshop summaries on our resources page and link to um, other resources. And you can also sign up for our free newsletter. And I'd just like to invite you to send, you, send us back some um, feedback today. You can do that by sending me an email or put your comments in the chat box and a Zoom survey link will pop up when, when we end this, um, when we end the webinar. Um, and I'd just like to mention that um, my colleague, Andrew Britton, I, I can't show this very well because I've got my background, but I have got some pig um, ag skill books. Um, I have was sent 11 of those. So um, I'm just offering people who do have pigs, if you would like to have one of these pig ag skill books, um, I'm more than happy to arrange to get one to you. Um, um, at the moment with COVID, it'll probably be a contactless pick up or sending, but if you're interested, um, do get in contact. So thanks so much, um, Dan and Lou. Dan's on mute. But thank you so much for your, for your contribution. Um, Stephen, I haven't asked you if you wanted to ask anything. Do we get, get there okay? Yeah, we did. I, I put in a couple of questions on that chat there and they've both been answered. So thank you. I think that's gone well. Okay, perfect. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you all for spending your um, Wednesday evening with us. Um, and um, I, I really hope that you've enjoyed it. And thanks so much to Lou and Dan for your wonderful contribution tonight. So I'm My going pleasure. to end the webinar there. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.